variety is show time. <laughs> Welcome. We'll be getting started shortly. So just give us a few minutes to allow um, participants to join. Welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, we'll be promptly getting started at the hour and I will turn it over to my um, esteemed colleague Udwak, who will be serving as your um, moderator today.
Hi, everyone. Hello, you're welcome. Um, <clears throat> I'd, um, I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, um, where we'll be discussing innovative public sector investment in family planning through TCI co-financing model in Nigeria. My name is Udwak Ananaba, and I'll be your moderator for the next hour and 30 minutes. Before I introduce the presenter for today and the discussant, here are a few housekeeping. Um, please double check to confirm that your mic is on mute when you're not talking or during the presentation. And we also have a question and answer box to type in your questions. The chat room is open for us to use to make comments mm -hmm. and make contributions to the presentation as we proceed. And then for those of us who want to add a voice to our question or make a comment, the raise hand button is here um, somewhere on the top. And then Lisa and I are on standby to help you out with that. To set the tone, we have our lead presenter, the director of TCI Nigeria, Dr. Victor Igaru. He'll be taking us through the TCI model, co-financing strategy, and how it works and also how the co-financing model performed in the public sector across the geographies in Nigeria. To join him in this webinar, we have representatives from four states, government representatives from four states in Nigeria, who will be sharing their experiences and drawing lessons. In no particular order, I'd like to introduce Mrs. Hajara Yahaya from Bauchi State. She's the Bauchi State Family Planning Coordinator she provides direction and oversight for family planning in the state. Hajara works seamlessly with implementing partners, media, civil society organizations, and community organizations in creating demand and <clears throat> improving access to family planning services in Bauchi State. We also have Mrs. Hannah Tudu, who is the reproductive health coordinator in Plateau State. Hanato held the position for 13 years, and ever since in her current position, she ensures that program activities are carried out in a timely manner, delivery of services is comprehensive and responsive, and family planning commodities are distributed and monitored. You're welcome. We also have Dr. Emema Bongjaja from River State. She is the maternal, neonatal, child health, focal person in the River State Primary Healthcare Management Board. She actively provides coordination, technical guidance, and oversight to the design, implementation, monitoring of maternal and child health interventions that promote community participation and involvement in an effort to improve maternal and child health outcomes mm -hmm. across all the local governments in River State. And finally, we have our gentleman here, Dr. Ahmed Kara, who is the Taraba State Advocacy Core Group Chairman. He is a public health physician and has been so for over 20 years, with 20 years experience. Mr. Kara was very instrumental to the stakeholder action towards the creating of family planning budget line in the state and subsequent releases. Without taking much of our time, I would like to hand over to our lead presenter, Dr. Victor Igaro, to use the next 20 to 25 minutes and take us through um, um, the, his presentation via his slides. Thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Victor. Okay, thank you so much, Udwak. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you may be joining us. Um, I want to join my voice to the moderator to welcome everyone to this webinar. and Thank you for making our time to join us. Um, just like the moderator mentioned, uh, we'll be sharing lessons um, on our innovative public sector investment um, in family planning that was demonstrated through the Challenge Initiative co-financing model in Nigeria. And in the next couple of minutes, I'll, I'll give an overview of how this co-financing strategy was conceptualized, um, how it is implemented, and some of the early results that we are seeing from the implementation. So first, um, I would like to start by defining the Challenge Initiative. For some of us that are hearing about the Challenge Initiative for the first time, um, first, it's important to learn that 
the challenge initiative was birthed out of the hypothesis that given a lot of investment that has gone into demonstrating and piloting series of high impact interventions across multiple health areas. Um, the question around scaling has been at the forefront of many conversations lately. However, we believe that um, scaling without impact is empty scale. Um, impact without scale or impact at scale without increasing cost efficiency or where scaling is even more expensive than the pilot is not viable and cost efficient impact at scale is definitely not sustainable. So how do we ensure that we deliver scale, impact and sustainability at um, a cost efficient manner is what gave birth to the challenge initiative. So the challenge initiative is a platform, you know, where we demonstrate scale, impact, efficiency, and sustainability um, by enabling local government um, to scale up high impact family planning approaches targeted at the urban poor. Um, the focus in the initial focus for the challenge initiative is family planning. Uh, but since, since we launched, we've had the opportunity to explore other health intervention areas like the adolescent reproductive health. And very recently, we are seeing um, the potential for expanding the platform to take on other reproductive health um, programs. The second um, fo focus here is the urban poor. And the, the reason why we're looking at the urban poor is that all the in indicators are pointing towards um, the, the, the fact that very soon we have more people living in urban slums. And so one way by which we can address that is by ensuring that the urban poor have access to family planning. And so we're using this as our entry point um, with, the, like, with, the, with the thinking that this will catalyze change across um, the system, even to other rural communities. We launched in 2016 globally. And since our launch, we've been able to demonstrate what we call a business unusual approach to driving improvements in social outcomes. Um, but like I did mention before, we're using urban reproductive health as our entry point. Um, our strategy and business model is really simple, but very, you know, very innovative and intuitive. Um, our, we primarily engage with local government and by local government, um, we refer to local government as states, state governments like you have in Nigeria, or cities like you have in other locations or even countries. And our mode of engaging, engaging local government is on the basis that they demonstrate political and financial commitment. It's also on the basis that the health system is ready to adapt this innovative way of doing um, development, as well as there has to be signed and commitment for local ownership. What we bring to the partnership is the first, we offer what we call the challenge fund. The challenge fund is a catalytic investment, which is used to actually test that it is possible to use little investments to demonstrate scale. Um, and the challenge fund is very flexible such that it attracts other investment and it is implemented in a manner that it leverages the co-investments of um, our, our local partners or local government. Um, then we also offer a platform for learning and evidence-based sharing called the TCI University. And the TCI University basically houses our high impact practices. It also acts as a platform for delivering coaching and technical support to everyone. It's open source, so anyone can come to the TCI University. Um, we have people coming in to learn about urban reproductive health. Um, we have people taking courses and all of that. So it's an open source platform. Then thirdly, we deliver technical assistance and our technical assistance is targeted at adaptation and scale. Um, and for adaptation, we talk about how do we um, adapt proven approaches or how do we code proven approaches and how do we drive those approaches to be delivered at scale using data and evidence for decision making and also constantly iterating and reiterating to ensure that we are delivering those interventions efficiently and those interventions are reaching um, the locations in a very customized manner. So we do not um, deploy any intervention across board, every location, every state and every 
um, um, community has its peculiar needs and those interventions are constantly adapted to meet those peculiar needs. So what we expect is that we want to, from this partnership, we want to see sustainability and we have a number of indicators by which we measure sustainability and we also want to see impact, which means that people should actually have access to high quality reproductive health services as a result of us partnering with local governments. The next thing I want to just talk about briefly is to give you a snapshot of how the Challenge Initiative has fared in Nigeria. In Nigeria, um, our core goal Victor, we can't hear you at the moment. Excuse us one moment, folks. Sorry, I think I got logged off. Great. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Thank you. Fantastic. So in, in, in Nigeria, our primary goal is to ensure greater self-reliance and um, for government to scale up family planning and adolescent reproductive health. Um, with specific focus on sustaining improvements in health systems as a whole. So the, the, the methodology that we use in Nigeria is that we identify states um, as the unit of engagement um, and we engage with states to be able to demonstrate these high impact interventions across the locations and across the health facilities within their control. However, within these states, we um, select demonstration site or demonstration facilities with which the government can test the model at a, at a smaller scale, then they can take that uh, model and scale it up across, across the states. And so far, um, we have about 12 implementing out of the 36 states in the country. We have the, um, the opportunity or the privilege to be seeded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but we also have other investment from Comic Relief, uh, BIA, and um, Dr. Victor, it's happening again. We lost you after um, um, comic relief in Bayer. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> we can now hear you, yeah. Yes, we lost you after. The network is a bit. Yes. But can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Sure. Yep, okay, we can hear great. you. So there, there are a number of guiding principles um, on which the Challenge Initiative is built. And there are six of them. The first is that, uh, every city that comes on board has to self-select, which means that they have to sign up voluntarily to join the platform and commit their own financial and human resources within the partnership. The next is that the city has to demonstrate that they are ready and they are also, ready, they are also willing to lead and drive implementation. Um, like I mentioned before, every city is unique in its own way and Every, every state or every city comes with its nuances and its context. So um, our role is to make sure that we customize the intervention that fits each context at every point in time. And we use data to constantly reiterate that, to ensure that it is what is of, what we deliver the greatest impact that is implemented per time. Then we also offer um, our coaching and the open source platform that I did mention earlier at the TCI University. And we leverage existing platforms that exist. So one of the things we do is that we try not to replicate or we try not to duplicate um, efforts. So whatever exists, we take that and build on it and take it to, to scale. So in, in terms of the path that cities follow when they come on board, um, I think it's important to know that there is a very systematic way by which any partner city engages with us. First is that they, they self-select 
after they self-select, they um, are required to commit resources, um, then commence implementation, and our implementation goes through a phase of startup to surge, then they enter into a phase of pre-graduation and then graduation. And at the point of graduation, we expect that every partner state um, demonstrates what we call self-reliance. And along this cascade, we have designed our, our technical assistance and coaching in a manner that provides the opportunity for our partner um, states to build their capacity to lead and drive over time. So in the initial phase, we lead the, um, the partnership, we lead implementation, and we demonstrate some of these high impact interventions, especially at those selected demonstration sites. And then we move to the next phase, which is assist. In the assist phase, we work together as co-implementers, and we are able to watch side by side with our, our state counterpart or our local government counterpart to see how they take those interventions to scale. Then we move to the final stage, which is observe. And really in the observe stage, the government and the um, local, local implementers are the ones that drive the implementation. We only provide advice and coaching on request. And so all of the cities within a partnership have to go through this cascade. And it's really interesting to see um, that we built the co-financing strategy to fit within this cascade. So what really is this co-financing strategy? Um, the the co-financing strategy in Nigeria is customized with a thinking that state governments in Nigeria face increasing financial and operational pressure. Of course, there's conflicting and competing demand for lean resources. And um, with the kind of structure that is operated in Nigeria, yeah. Um, governments have to be, state governments have to be very creative in being able to sustain their developmental interventions. And so these pressures that government face is also compounded by the fact that lately um, external funding is declining and with COVID coming in and all of that, it means that um, donors are reprioritizing where they want to put their resources. And so it is on the basis of this that we decided to design this co-financing strategy on the basis that um, if we distribute the responsibility to finance family planning intervention early enough in the design of the project, government will be able to allocate and sustain the scarce financial resources. They will also be able to use these scarce financial resources as catalysts to unlock more resources. Um, that puts them in a position to be able to negotiate with other investors you know, using the available resources at their disposal. And of course, ensuring that they deliver quality services to those that really need it. Um, the other thing that this does is that by creating a pool of resources or a pool of funds, we, the co-financing strategy is such that it is not just a, a two-way traffic between TCI and government, but rather it opens up the space for even other partners that are interested in putting their resources and also create an opportunity where financial resources may not necessarily be put within the partnership, but other things like in-kind resources, like human resources and others can be invested and can be accounted for. Then, then finally, what it really does is it helps to track FP expenditure. One of the challenges we've had over the years is that people really don't know how much is really spent for family planning. So what the co-financing strategy does is to create greater transparency and also um, greater level of accountability in knowing what really goes into driving family planning programs in every city. And um, the, the co-financing strategy is therefore conceptualized around three key premises. First is that we introduce a graduated mechanism such that states that come on board are required to grow into how much they are able to put into the partnership over time as they transition towards self-reliance. The second thing that the co-financing strategy does is that rather than just look at financing as an isolated piece, we look at the entire um, system, the entire physical space and we ask, 
what does it really take for governments to finance family planning programs? So we engage at the level of policy and program advocacy. We deploy in the networks, pressure groups, and we also help government to build tools, tools that will help it to become more fiscally responsive and, um, and strengthen the entire health system to be more resilient beyond FP. Then thirdly, it builds in a system of transparency and accountability that is not based on what, what makes sense for everybody or is not based on the usual carrot and stick that we see with um, financing, with development financing, but rather it the, with transparency is used for key decision making at all levels, at the level of policymakers, at the level of um, family planning managers, also at the level of implementers and even other implementing partners. So we built the co-financing strategy um, at two layers. The first layer looks at the financing part. The second layer looks at the adaptive leadership part. And so the way the co-financing model works is that the financing part, um, like I said, introduces a graduated system where as cities come on board, they are not necessarily required. It's not demanded from them that they have to put money on the table from the very beginning. And I just want to also mention um, that our approach is not to use, we don't put money in the basket. So the government is able to keep their funds. Um, TCI is able to keep its funds, but rather we co-develop work plans and every partner knows what is what they are supposed to implement within that co uh, within that collective work plan and they know when they should implement and how much they should implement and we operate a very transparent dashboard such that on a very regular basis every partner can see what is being implemented and they can even um, use that to predict expenditure for the next quarter or so, or they can use that as a tool to go back to say, hey, within this partnership, we are not looking very good. Is there a way we can find more resources? Or can we talk to other partners to help? Or is there a way we can leverage more resources or, or create savings in one way or the other? So, but as, 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 the, um, as the partnership goes on, um, we, at the end of the first year of implementation, we usually demand that our partner local government, that is the state government in this context, um, brings a minimum of 25% um, to the table. And of course, this matching um, um, ratio increases over time. By the second year, it should be 33%. By the third year, it should be 50%. And by the time the government is graduating from the partnership, as they go towards a point where they, we, are, they, we, we win them off um, towards self-reliance, they should be bringing a, a critical bulk of the amount up to 75%. And of course, we align the um, coaching, our coaching methodology within these different phases. And as you can see, our lead state stage really occurs within the first year, helping government to governize all that is required to make sure that the financing system works, while also ensuring that program implementation is ramped up. And of course, as the system matures and they're able to finance the family planning programs gradually, we are able to transition to the assist phase. Then as we get towards the tail end of the partnership, we move towards the observed phase. So this is really how um, the co-financing um, architecture is designed. So um, getting into the meat of the matter, I think it's important to see how in real terms, how each government, state government gets what they get every year. So um, at the beginning of the partnership, um, each government, um, each state government is required to develop what we call a program design, which in its sense is like a proposal, but it's like, um, it's not the usual proposal where there is no flexibility around what should be implemented over time. But rather, the program design helps to identify what should, what should be priority over the um, period of the partnership. And one of the outputs within the program design is that there is a work plan, the first work plan. And so within that first work plan, we demand that government demonstrates that they are willing to make investment in family planning. 
So at the end of that year, of the first year, um, TCI conducts a joint review of the state performance. And of course, also the expenditure to determine how the expectations were met. Even though within the first year, we do not create any benchmark, we do what we call zero-based budgeting. So there is a pool of funds and we tell them, you know what, you can assess the, these funds, but you need to demonstrate that you're willing to make investment. So at the end of that year, we come back and look at um, how the state fares and we use a set of performance metrics to determine um, um, performance and we actually provide what we call accrued reward to the state in the, at the end of the first year. So this accrued reward usually is an amount of money that is predetermined using certain indicators. Um, so those indicators span from um, program indicators like um, indicators that measure the absorptive capacity. We, for example, what was planned versus what was implemented because we usually see that government likes to, when, when they see donor money, they like to take on a lot of things with the assumption that, oh, this donor money will solve all of our problems. But what we try to do is to make sure that they focus on high impact intervention and what is really feasible. And so um, we also measure things around data quality. We also measure things around programmatic indicators like increased access and quality of care. And we also include indicators like financing. So within the accrued reward, we look at how government is able to assign money to the budget line and reward them by, uh, by point averages that is calibrated through some algorithm on our dashboard. Um, then we also measure how government is able to leverage resources from other sources, as well as how much resources is able to release. So that forms the bulk of the accrued reward. Um, but many times we see that the accrued reward might not be sufficient for them to implement within the next year. So we provide what we call supplemental funding. So the supplemental funding and the accrued reward um, make up the envelope that government is able to assess in the new year. And so let, let me just say that this is envelope. This is not con this is not a fixed commitment. What this means is that you have this amount of money you've been able to unlock. However, the extent to which you will unlock it will depend on how much you are able to match it over the years. And there is no guarantee that government cannot go outside of the envelope or they cannot fall within under the envelope. It is based on how they are able to match it. That is what determines how much resources that they get. But we should also remember that by the time they move into by the second or the third year, we have government, state governments that may not really perform very well in the previous year. When they don't perform very well in the previous year, the, um, the accrued reward that they should get, they pay, they, they, they pay back. It's like you're taking a loan um, when you should have matched 25%, you only match 20%. So it means that you owe me 5%. So it's like you're, you're taking a loan from us and you have to pay the 5%. So that forms our excess or deficit adjustment. So we adjust um, the allocation for the new year by excess or deficit. And, and the typical excess scenario is that where um, a, a government is supposed to um, bring 25% and they bring 30%, you know, um, we reward them for that five, extra 5% 5 because it means that they went above and beyond. So by the time you add the deficit and the excess to the original envelope that has been allocated, this makes the bulk of the ceiling that they have available for the new year. And so this goes on year on year. And so really, um, could you advance the slide, please? And so really, where the partnership, where the co-financing co uh, or matching ratio happens is at the point where we have the allocated envelope and the matching fund. The deficit and the excess is just based on how they fed in the previous year, whether they are owing us or whether we are owing them. You know, and, and, and the total amount that they get is termed a ceiling, it's not a guarantee. And so, so sorry, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Fantastic. So, so there's really no guarantee that you um, you can get all the funds. It is how you are yep. able to match year on year that, 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 that determines it. So the next is that um, let's look at how this performance incentive framework. So we have a mechanism called the performance incentive framework. And the framework has two arms. 
Basically, one arm looks at how on a routine basis we track implementation so that we don't wait to the end of the journey. We don't wait to the end of the year before we come back and start looking at how states are faring, but we can look at um, performance on a more routine basis and even use that data for advocacy, use that data to engage with government, and also use that data to calibrate how we release funds, you know, on a more routine basis. Um, so that is on one hand. On the other hand, we conduct at the end of the year what we call the grant performance analysis. And so the grant performance analysis is what we use to determine um, how much accrued rewards the government gets every year. So these two um, elements within the performance incentive framework work together to ensure that the decision on how much um, a, a government gets within the partnership, it's evidence-based, it is transparent, and it is context-specific. Specific. So we do not necessarily pitch one state against another state. The state competes within themselves and within their capacity. And it is very interesting in a way that we have situations where a state could say, yes, you have given me, I've unlocked so much, but how much I need to match is really a lot. I won't be able to match so much. So can I reduce how much I can match so that I also reduce how much I can get? It is also possible. And so this framework, it's so flexible and very agile and allows all of those adjustments to be made on a very um, um, flexible manner. So th this really is how the per um, performance incentive framework works. Now, putting all of that together, looking at the strategy and looking at the performance, um, performance incentive framework, um, we will see that as the funds are released and adjusted, and as we offer on a yearly basis the envelope and the ceilings to the government for which they are required to match, the performance framework is embedded within that cascade. And on a very routine basis, that framework is deployed. And so we design a, a dashboard that is updated on a monthly basis where um, anybody can have access, anybody within the partnership, I mean, it's not a public um, dashboard, but anyone within the partnership can actually have access and see how they fare. And they're able to retrospectively look at um, how they fared in the past and compare that with how they um, are likely to fare in the future. And the dashboard is built in such a way that we can even predict how much resources a partner state is able to get within the next year, even at the beginning or at the middle of the year. So states can actually ramp up their investments when they see that they are, they are not unlocking as much resources, or states can um, look at within their envelope and move resources around so that they do not fall short in meeting the requirements of the, of the, of the partnership. So let's look at the results um, and, and, and really just share some learning around what we've been able to achieve so far. So in the last three years that we've operated this um, co-financing strategy, it's interesting to see that um, over $2 million have actually been released as cash from our partner government. And these $2 million have, is from only 10, 10 states because two states um, recently joined and we have not factored it into this analysis. So this $2 million is from 10 states, but it didn't just start um, from, from the, it was a very long journey. So you can imagine that in 2017, 2018 year, um, so it's 2017, 2018, because our fiscal year runs um, from, from, Ju from July to June, you know? So from 20, 2017, 2018, where we had just five states, you can see that the investment was not so much. Of course, there was an improvement in 2018 to 2019 when we had all the 10 states. And in keeping those 10 states in 2019 to 2020, we also saw an increase. But let's look at the state-specific um, performance. Um, it is it, interesting to see that if you look at our state, the 10 states in question, um, categorized as phase one states and phase two states. The phase one states are the first five states that were onboarded at the beginning of the partnership. Why the phase two states came one year after the phase one states came on board. You will see that um, overall, it, it, it looks like the expected versus the actual, you know, it, it's not looking very good, except maybe for Bauchi states that has a very high level of actual release versus expected. But if you see the phase two states, the actual 
is actually higher than they expected. And, and one key lesson that we can deduce from this is that because the co-financing strategy was pretty new with the phase one states, um, the idea around just throwing in activities that might not realistically be implemented was what we experienced. But after the first year and also after gathering lessons from the first cohort, we saw that um, states are more realistically able to plan for what they can do. And indeed, they, they are even able to exceed that plan, which is what we really want to see. We want to see realistic planning, realistic implementation. So even though we see that um, the first set of states have a lot of expected as compared to release, the releases are still progressive and they are, they are, they are, they are pretty fair when you compare um, where they are coming from, where family planning investment was almost non-existent. I think it's also important to mention that when we started this partnership, all our, all our 10 states, only four out of the 10 states have a dedicated budget level family planning. But right now, as we speak, all the states have dedicated budget line for family planning. Releases are progressive, and even beyond the dedicated budget line, they are able to unlock other resources from other sources like um, intervention funds and loans and, and, and um, primary health care budget and all of that, So, which is quite impressive. So the next slide um, also just zeroes in on some of the specifics um, that we see across uh, our, face, our, our states. So this, for this first um, phase, we see that, um, so for this first phase, we see that even though we did not expect any matching ratio in the first year, we saw our, our partner states actually matching our investment by 30, about 34%. So 34% of the total investment between TCI and our partner states was, about, was, was actually brought to the table, which goes beyond our expectation. While in the second year, where we had an expectation of about 25%, um, we had states um, matching by 23%. Of course, which is not up to the benchmark, but it, it, it also shows um, um, some progress. But you will see that the size of investment increased, even though the ratio was lesser than the previous year. But by the third year, the benchmark was 33%, and collectively we saw our phase one states Reach, reaching up to 39%, which goes way above the benchmark. Of course, in, this, in the phase two state, which, which, which we'll see in the next slide, we saw a similar trend where in the first year, um, we didn't expect any match, but we saw about 32% of resources matched. In the second year, we expected only 25%, and we saw a total of 40% uh, matching ratio between government investment and the challenge initiative. So really, um, with all of these results and also looking at some of the programmatic um, um, impact that has been demonstrated, it is, it is really refreshing to see that this co-financing strategy has been very successful. So as I, as I, as I conclude um, on my presentation, I want to mention that this, the TCI model itself, where states have to self-select, where they have to commit to bring their resources to the table, when they have to demonstrate that they are willing to lead and drive implementation. And you match that with the coaching strategy in which we lead, then move to the assist stage, then move to the observe stage, has been very successful in being able to um, catalyze improvement in key indicators, but also causing improvement in domestic resources for family planning. But interestingly, it is creating a system, a sustainable system for community action and local ownership in a very seamless manner that is potentially sustainable even after we leave the partnership. The second thing that we've seen um, with this co-financing mechanism is that it's generally improving the family planning funding landscape because government is better able to engage with other partners and optimize resources. We are seeing situations where because of the consolidated work plan that we help the states to develop with the other partners as well as TCI, we are able to see better um, family planning budget allocation and releases. And because of how we demand that those work plans be developed in a timely manner, family planning work plans are even ready before the annual operational planning cycle opens. So which means that the family planning department or unit have their budget and their ask ready. We are also seeing that government is being creative in how they are resources. 
and they are not seeing the civil society organizations or some of those pressure groups like the budget tracking teams and the um, advocacy core groups that we help to set up in the state. They don't, they no longer see them as outsiders, but they see them as partners in progress in helping them to leverage resources from government. Um, then we are also seeing greater transparency in budgeting and program implementation. Then finally, I want to mention that um, this model, the collective model of the TCI model and the co-financing strategy has been very helpful in being able to um, strengthen government accountability and responsiveness in domestic financing for health program, programs. So I want to thank you so much for listening to this introduction. Um, I, I, will, I will ask that you engage with our resources. Um, we have the co-financing strategy published um, on our platform and the link is there. And we recently published um, the MIDI challenge report for 2020, which chronicles um, how states are fed in the last three years. Um, you can find that report and, and, and read it. Um, at this point, I would like to hand over to um, the moderator who will take us to the next set of presentations. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Victor. Thank you for sharing those um, detailed insights around co-financing strategy and walking us through the process of co-financing partnership with the states at the entire performance tracking framework. So over the next few minutes, we'll be discussing the FP financing situation with states sharing their experiences, what catalyzes changes, and also try to explore the difference, the, the linkages between co-financing model and the program results. So each state has um, five to eight minutes to share insights. Taraba State will go first and will talk us through how the model evolved over time and the drivers that change, what drove you know, the change in FP financing space. So over to you, Taraba State. Dr. Kara, please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello, Dr. Amin, we can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this brief with you. Uh, I'm sharing Tarabas an experience, and uh, we'll talk about how the FP financing evolved over time before and after partnership with GCI. And now, the background here, before we started partnering with TCI, there was lack of a dedicated budget line for family planning in Taraba State. And then the fund, we are not released. Even when they were released, they were inconsistent and inadequate. And then uh, there was lack of advocates for family planning funding in the state and even within the community. And then there was very minimal funding for family planning consumables in the state. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is just a chart to show us about the health budget for the state minister of health and then the actual releases. You look at here 2015, 2016, 17 to 2021. You look at the budget for 2015 was about 7 billion. And then the release was about 3, 3 billion. And then you look at 2016, 5 billion, release about 3.2 billion and there about up to 2021, where the budget is 6 billion and then the release is not yet. Now, the second graph is just trying to show what was actually released for family planning, what was budgeted and released for family planning in Taraba State. 2015, 2016, 2017, then TCI was not in Taraba State. If you look at that time, despite the budget that you have seen on the first graph, there was no budget for family planning at all. 2015, zero budget for family planning. 2016, zero budget for family planning. 2017, zero for family planning. It was 2018 when TCI came to Taraba that you now see that there's a slight budget for family planning. Uh, in 2018, you look at 2018, the total budget is about 42, well, it's not actually budget. I would say we came up with a work plan for the complete state, and that work plan stood at 42 million naira. But however, the state was able to commit about uh, 18 million naira, which was for family planning, which was very good. Then in 2019, 
the state was supposed to commit a little more, but because of the intensive activities of TCI, the state committed up to about 34 million naira, which is about, which is more than what was expected. And then in 2020, the state committed 36 million, but however, they released only 20 million. And you know, this one, one can likely say it is because of the COVID activity that happened, and some of the funds had to be diverted to take care of COVID-19 pandemic. Now in 2021, the budget rose to about 202 million naira from an initial budget of 30, 36, and now 202 million naira for Taraba State. Next slide, please. Now, the actual support by TCI commenced in Taraba in July 2018. And then the main thing there was the structure and creation of gradual for the final unit by TCI and the information of ACG in November 2018, which I'm still the chairman till today. And then there was some formation of a um, budget tracking team that advocated to high level government places. We advocated to the Speaker at Taraba House of Assembly. We advocated to the Accountant General of the State, the City Secretary Taraba State Public Health Care Emergency, Honorable Commissioner of Health, State Minister of Health, and then Honorable Commissioner of Finance for creation of family budget line. And that year we succeeded in getting family planning budget line of 30 million naira. And then if you look at it again, subsequently, the family planning budget line kept increasing until 2020, 2021, when it rose to about 202 million naira. Next slide, please. Now, I have said this before, that initially our work plan stood at 42 million naira, but government was able to release 80 million naira, 8 million, 716 million naira, which is about 20.5% of what we actually estimated. Now, if you look at in 2019, government was supposed to commit 18.973 million naira, but government committed, released 34.763, which is about 100. 183% above what they were supposed to have provided. And then we also mentioned about the sources of funding, specifically several million life performance for the Zodan Ship, primary health care, and then the State Minister of Health. Next slide, please. Now, what are the drivers of this incremental matching funds? The co financing model has actually stimulated the state to allocate more funds for family planning. And then this can be seen where government spent about 34 million naira above what they are committed to spend in 2019. They already committed that they will spend 18 million, but they ended up spending 34 million naira. Then some of these drivers of this incremental for releases by government is that there are yearly increase in acceptors, which has also assist, assisted informed decision making for the technical working group and subsequent government releases for family planning. And then there was integration of family planning demands creation, high impact activities, such as community engagement, neighborhood campaigns, and service delivery, such as enriches, outreaches, into other healthcare interventions in the state. And then there was also formation of this partners forum in Taraba, where each partner, wherever they go to any part of the state, they speak specifically about family planning and try to increase the number of acceptors for family planning. Next slide, please. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much. Thank you, Taraba State. So very quickly, um, we'll hear from River States and we expect River State to share insights on how the co-financing model aided government to release funds and how that translates to scaling up high impact interventions. Over to you, Dr. Jada. Thank you so much, Udua. Thank you, everyone. And uh, it's good to be here with us. So from River State, I'll be sharing some of our experiences and our insights from this co-financing model. For us, um, our funding sources for family planning has been um, having a budget line, dedicated budget line for family planning services, having also at the primary healthcare level, the primary healthcare management board and the local government derivation funds, the saving 1 million lives um, performance for results as well as other partners that we have leveraged on to be able to generate funds and to raise funds for family planning services and other services in reproductive health. 
We've also, um, with this co-financing, it has brought in a fresh perspective on working with our partners, ensuring accountability at every level, effective planning and efficiency in delivery of our services. So, but um, we would like to tell us how this co-financing model has been able to get the government and the policymakers to release substantial funds for family planning. Now, before, uh, like I said earlier, our budget line in family planning used to be subsumed under the reproductive health budget line. But with the establishment of a dedicated budget line, we are now able to put in our requests for uh, family planning programs and services, and we have been able to get releases. Then we also, um, the data that is generated from our programs um, that we have carried out through advocacy efforts, we have these regular feedback platforms and meetings where we give feedback from um, our program data, triangulating, triangulating the, those with our financial data, and it has been seen to, to yield a whole lot of um, in, improvements in the service provision, and it has been an encouragement. Then our funding has also not just been uh, in a parallel level, only family planning, we've been able to integrate other primary healthcare programs into our funding, uh, into the funding um, that is being released. Then there has also been transparency, accountability on the TCI co-financing model, which has been able to end government trust in the um, model. Our policymakers, our family planning technocrats are part of the design, they are part of the planning, and implementation of the program right from the inception and which makes everyone comfortable about the program, such as when we had the family planning um, costed implementation plan, everyone was part of it from the inception. Our enriches when we plan, design and implement our enrich programs, family planning and um, COVID integration programs and all. So this grant management orientation has helped in facilitating shared understanding and commitment. So the next slide. Now we'll just look at, um, have an insight on how the co-financing model has been able to scale up high impact interventions in River State and how this has made our system more efficient. There has been increase in um, fund release and more high impact interventions across different thematic areas have been receiving funding such as our advocacy thematic areas, service delivery demand generation areas have been able to have increase in our fundings released in those areas for high impact interventions. We also have efficient service provision. Even though um, there's been competing demands for lean resources, we place a lot of emphasis on integration. So for us, integration has been key and it has led to a lot of, um, made our service provisions more efficient. We now have consumables in our facilities across our various facilities. And it has, uh, we also have um, uh, an increased funding in even support of the WDCs, what we call the WDCs, the World Development Committees, a committee that helps to create a lot of awareness on health programs. And this has really led to efficient service provision. There's also been ownership and accountability in our family planning programming at the government level, at all levels, at the state level, the local government level, the facilities. Everyone owns the program because we are all part of the planning, the implementation, the designing of these programs, the evaluation, um, monitoring and evaluation of these programs at the end of the day. So everyone is really part of it. And so the ownership is, is top and accountability at the end with our feedback given on our various programs. Then we, there is also intentionality with committing funding for family planning and reproductive health programs. There's been a lot of intentionality in this over time. And we have also realized from our data that when we put in funds into family planning programs, into reproductive health programs and integrate them into other primary healthcare activities, we have come to notice that there's an, a commensurate um, um, reflection on the primary healthcare utilization in, um, in, the, in the facilities. And we can see that in that graph there, where funding was injected into um, the COVID FP integration activities and other primary healthcare activities, we can see that, you know, it was injected in for family planning and other activities, but there was an improvement also in the primary healthcare utilization. 
Even when funding was injected in for in reaches of sometime in September last year, we could also see that there was an improvement in the entire system in, in utilization of services. So there has been that int intentionality by the time we bring this up and show them to our stakeholders, they get impressed that whatever little funding is that is put in, there's a commensurate improvement at all levels. And there's also been diffusion by scope and geography. Um, our, most of our high impact interventions has been able to be diffused to not just um, facilities that are supported by some partners, but in all the higher LGs, we've been able to um, diffuse the whole site orientations, the enriches to almost all our um, LGAs and it has really yielded a whole lot of improvement. So, you know, this has also led to a lot of increase in service delivery in our facilities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jaja. We encourage everyone to keep your questions coming in. Um, so while we bring on Bauchi State um, government representative, we'll expect that she will share her experiences around other key factors that contributed to incremental funding. So over to you, Mrs. Hajara Yahaya. Okay, good afternoon all. Um, can I have the slide, please? So um, in Bauchi State, uh, this, uh, with uh, FP project line in emergency, there have been consistent budget allocation from 2018 to date. And also we have funds from the uh, PSC Memorandum of Understanding Funding, that is the basket fund. And also advocacy activity by the ACG has really helped in, uh, in the increasing the activities of uh, child birth spaces in the state in terms of uh, uh, following up for budget release and ensuring that uh, our family, uh, state minister of health uh, budget, annual budget. And also we have uh, set targets and strategies uh, uh, in using the state's uh, health strategic development uh, plan. And we also have our state CIP and the annual operational plan where we have activities for family planning specifically spelled out. And we also ensure that all the activities there are activities that are going to bring increase in the quality and of uh, FP services, ensuring we have trained service providers uh, we have uh, quality service of child birth facing in the state, equipments are there, and we have data to support our, our uh, programs. And cost effective of high impact intervention was also used, like uh, the, in the family planning clinics in the state, in some of the facilities in the state. And have, we also saw how it's improved in the uptake of quality services in the state. Because with little cost, we're able to achieve uh, a lot in terms of giving this, uh, the clinic a, a total change of facelift, which occurs within 72 hours. Everything is in place. We have equipment. And also, uh, it's, it's the cost. And it involves community. The, the, the people at the community level where this, the facility is situated are involved in this activity with, with a very little cost. And also to ensure that we have quality services, there is this on the job training that is being carried out on. on uh, this, Service providers, the clinical service services, and we follow up with to ensure that after the training, are they putting into place what have been taught to them, and also enriches are carried out in those uh, facilities to ensure that we get across to women in the communities. And linking this uh, results and financing, the, the state has 
as reported above, one of the six increase in annual client volume. Prior to this, there was a contraceptive method in the facility. This is, the service providers have been trained and this clinic is very, very convenient for the women because we know uh, we have a waiting time and they don't get the kind of services they, are, they require. So with the intervention of TCI in the state, with this 72-hour uh, makeover, uh, provision of uh, equipment, trained service provider, setting up of the uh, quality improvement team in the facility, who see to the day-to-day -to -day activities of the service provider to ensure that the women got what they want when they go to the facility. And when we look at our data of the 20, uh, 2013, which indicated that our model for the septic rate was 2% in 2013. And now we have moved to 5.2, going by the DHS of 2018. We are moving forward. Next slide, please. And other additional factors that had influenced the state to adopt the high level uh, interveners and cost, if, and cost efficiency, uh, efficiency of high impact intervention, which is the use of little funds to achieve bigger outcomes. Regular tracking and review of performance, quarterly scorecard, fact sheets, which uh, shows that there's a consistent increase in service uptake data. And also our MIE officials in the states have been trained on how to enter our data correctly to use those data to infect uh, activities. And there's an increased demand for FP services, as I said earlier, which is owning to the use of, uh, of many things that have been put in place in terms of service, knowledge, service providers, knowledge and skills, uh, continuous uh, supportive supervision, enriched and outreach that have been carried out in, in, in most of the facilities, or, or rather all the facilities that are offering FV services has brought in the, uh, the increase because with correct entry, we're able to track the number of women and community pers uh, participation in terms of mobilization of uh, traditional rulers, religious leader, uh, rulers, and um, yeah, youth group, uh, community theater, during any of act any activities that is going on in the community, whereby uh, we advocate for women to adopt modern child by the, the, uh, in order to uh, to save the lives of women and now strong voices for FP services is no longer things that are not discussed openly. And also the efforts of the SBCC committee, interfaith forums, community theater, social mobilization activities like the neighborhood campaign has also helped. And then integrated PHC and uh, uh, reproductive maternal and neonatal child health and whereby we are using it in such a way that wherever vision is just the MSCH week that is all in this nutrition week, we used every opportunity to give all the services is in terms of uh, immunization, ensure women come for ANC, hospital delivery, and also ensure that after delivery, women access FV services. Then we educate women on the right diet to, to take when pregnant in bringing up the uptake of modern child, uh, modern child by uh, 
facing in Thank you so much from Bauchi. Thank you so much. We apologize for that network issue. Thank you, Hajara. Okay, so very Thank quickly. You. Thank you so much. So very quickly, we would like Plateau State to use the next five minutes and take us through how the financial commitment is tracked and okay. how all of this sits within the RMNCAX spectrum. So very quickly, Plateau. And then please keep your questions coming on so that um, the lead presenter can also answer. Thank you so much. Over to you, Plateau State. Mrs. Doom, please. All right. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak at this time. Can I have the slide? Can I have the next slide? Uh, so uh, for Plateau State, I'm speaking on how the state team tracking financial commitment and releases from government and how to use, uh, how do we use it uh, to ensure that these funds are utilized properly. So for us in Plateau State, uh, our government uh, funding comes to us, uh, is multidimensional. We have multiple sources of uh, funding from primary health care board, from the PSD derivation funds, that comes from the 17 LGAs and we also have from the family planning budget line. So how do we track this? Um, when funds are released, uh, they are released via the uh, memos that were submitted and approved and funds released. So government memos, we also have annual operational plan scorecard. Uh, so um, for uh, operational plan, we look at how much we government was able to invest in it and uh, we do a scorecard on it. And then we have budget tracking team. There is a budget tracking team, which is a subset of the uh, advocacy core group uh, that also follows up with the relevant MDAs to be sure that uh, um, whatsoever is in the budget is being released and is being utilized. We have reports from uh, TWGs, uh, the technical working groups that are working with us in the area of uh, family planning and uh, so an adolescent uh, reproductive uh, health. We all, they also give us reports. And so this is how we, this is being tracked. TCI tracking tool. We have a TCI tracking tool that tracks uh, the various uh, funding that come into the state and are being utilized. Then we also, uh, to ensure funds are used properly. Uh, this is done through supportive supervision. We have means of verification such as receipts, attendance, uh, sheets, uh, meeting reports, and experience sharing from uh, participants too. And like I will always say, within the system, uh, government, you know, there's a department of uh, finance and supply that also keeps track of releases, um, retirements, uh, documentation. So there's a proper documentation system in the uh, state. Next slide. Next slide. Um, how might this uh, new co-financing mechanism have influenced RMNCH financing overall in the state? Uh, so for us in the state, it has actually uh, greatly done uh, uh, influence uh, funding of other programs. Uh, so we have increasing proof on co-financing strategies for programs across the broad spectrum of reproductive maternal newborn and child health. Uh, so other programs like the CHIPS that is uh, community health uh, influencers, promoters, uh, services. And then um, we also have the State Emergency Maternal Child Health Intervention Center. Uh, all these are uh, platforms that have been made to a coordinating uh, platform, like the SEMCHIC is a coordinating platform to ensure that all RMSCH interventions um, are uh, implemented through this uh, synergy. And, uh, the, the, and then the CHIPS are, within the community, there are community people that uh, provide information, health information that we promote health. And so they serve as uh, people who search within the community and do referrals to uh, referral centers. So government uh, using the co-financing model is financing this. We also have partner involvement. And then we have improved cost effectiveness for hospital projects such as the 72 hour uh, makeover, providing enabling environment for reproductive maternal and newborn and child health. So using family planning as our pointer, uh, 72 hour makeover in health facilities, um, 
was extended to reach out to areas like the maternity, the uh, antenatal clinic hall, and so on. So it gave the facility a, a new look, um, user-friendly, and attract uh, clients to come to the facility. So government also put in counterpart to ensure that and have replicated also this 72 hour makeover in other facilities. We also have increased political commitment and investment on high impact intervention. Um, the government is more uh, interested and willing, committed to put in, to invest more in, in, in the model, the co-financing model because of its transparency and accountability. Uh, we, we're seeing it, things are seen for real. And then we also have improved government financing slash accountability, which I've also talked. And so um, uh, what we see visible coaching uh, on the job training, supportive supervision, uh, the high, uh, high impact interventions as my uh, other colleagues have mentioned. Uh, so we have in our facilities, uh, WSO, that is uh, whole site orientation uh, is being done. Uh, quality improvement teams are being uh, established in facilities so, that, so as to oversee what is happening in the facility and also see where they need to come in as community people. And then we also have um, uh, within uh, what we are doing, um, performance-based uh, assessment, performance-based uh, plan and then we also have annual operational plan extending to other program areas from reproductive maternal and newborn and child health. Uh, so in a, if you look at an annual operational plan, you're going to see that it is well captured. The RMSDH uh, component is well captured in the uh, annual operational plan. So and indeed, uh, this has been as a result of the co-financing state have learned that they need to do a matching. So there is a matching fund mechanism that exists in the state, uh, which has been, which is a learning from TCI uh, and has actually been very useful to us. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all the states um, for your presentation, the shared experiences, the insights. We are open to questions now. And and um, looking at the question and answer box, um, there have been quite a number of questions, 10 actually, and the lead presenter, Dr. Victor, has been answering all of that. So we ask that you keep the questions coming, but very quickly, I'd like to take us through the comment section. I think we have a few comments here. Um, so someone said, I appreciate TCI for the wonderful things they are doing. I believe that part of the funding is channeled towards human resource management and capacity building. But it's surprising that after putting in resources in building human capacity due to some political issues in some states, the individual will be removed automatically without properly impacting the knowledge by way of mentoring to the successor. What is TCI doing to ensure that the resources invested on such individual is not a waste? Maybe I'll call um, Victor Igaro to try to answer that. I thought it was a comment. Um, it's a question. And then before he comes on to answer, I'll quickly read the next one, um, which is a comment, very encouraging intentionality and impact from River State reports the aggregated diffusion of impact right down to the world development committee level is particularly encouraging. And also a comment to Hajara from Bauchi. However, just to add that SCG conducted series of evidence-based advocacy to the Bauchi state governor in 2018, which resulted in creation of budget line for family planning in the state. For the first time, family planning was able to have um, about 190 million in 2018 budget of Bauchi states. So I will call Dr. Victor to answer the first question I read out. I don't know if it's on standby. Dr. Victor, please. Okay, thank you so much, um, Uduak, for, for, for the excellent moderation and, and thank you for the questions. Thanks everyone that has dropped um, one question or the, or the other. I think all the questions are really engaging. We've tried to respond 
um, to some of them as much as possible. But to answer the question about human resource, uh, I think that's a very um, good point that you've raised. And indeed, um, it, it's one of the challenges that we experienced at the beginning. Um, but how we approached it is to look beyond the challenge I present and, and, and see um, the impact that that creates for the entire health system. And I'll explain in, in, a, in a minute. Um, when we engage with certain healthcare workers that are exposed to the TCI platform, um, whether it's a coaching, capacity building, and all of that, it is painful to see that some of these healthcare workers are redeployed or transferred, or even some of them retire. Um, and that, that usually is a setback because you now have to retrain or re-expose the new set of the healthcare workers. But the good side about how we operate is that we work with a network of coaches and mentors within the states. So every state that we partner with, we identify coaches and mentors and we, we engage them as master coaches and mentors. So the initial engagement might be from us, or subsequent engagement are usually from these master mentors to other mentees that may come on board. The second blessing, which I say it's in disguise, is that some of these people that are transferred, if they are transferred to a location where TCI is not actively engaged in, they become ambassadors and advocates and sort of they pollinate the model to those new locations. So what the trend we see um, in many of our locations is that because of how we engage as a state level, regardless of whether the local government is a focal local government for demonstration or whether the health facility is a selected facility for demonstration, we see a positive trend across board because many of the family planning and reproductive health coordinators provide oversight for the entire state Many of them even provide oversight for other program areas. So they take the learning from the engagement with TCI for family planning and apply that learning um, to other program areas and even across board. The other thing that we also encourage is that our work really is to strengthen health systems. Um, increasing access is good, but strengthening the health system is better. So what we really do is that all the groups that we engage, whether through technical working groups or the advocacy call groups or the technical committees like the um, social behavior change communication, um, technical working group and all of that, they are done at the level of the states. So all the members, are, all the representatives across all the LGAs are members of those committees. So each time we want to coach, we coach at the level of the committees. And indeed, when we want to even um, select the master coaches, we select them from the um, state technical working groups and all of these platforms. So whether they, they have um, funds to do implementation or whether the, the, the particular LG or facility is selected or whether they, transfer from, they are transferred from one point to the other, we are able to really disseminate the model across board. And finally, I also want to say that because our level of engagement with government for accountability is at the state level. So we do not tell, we do not tell government release money only for implementation in this demonstration, local government areas or these demonstration health facilities. We tell them release money to drive family planning programs. And so when they develop the consolidated work plan every year, it is a state work plan. It's not a TCI work plan. It is not a, a health facility work plan. So it's a state work plan. So the entire state benefits you know, when resources are increased for family planning. So when trainings are done, they are done across board. When um, commodities or consumables are procured, they are procured across board. When um, um, supportive supervision is done, it's done across board. When voluntary mobilization is even done, we are seeing that voluntary mobilization is happening even outside of the areas where we are trained um, 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 vol um, voluntary mo mobilizers. So, so that really is a cascade that we are seeing um, through our engagement with government. And, and for the want of time, I would have been able to walk you through some of the other re um, um, reproductive maternal newborn and child health indicators that we are seeing a positive shift that we may not necessarily be intentionally programming for, but our exposure is actually causing that shift to happen. I, I hope that answers the question. Um, I, I don't know if if I have time to take maybe one or two questions in the chat that 
might might be um, that I may not have been able to exhaust. Some of them are really long, um, but just to add, just to say, um, so there is a question around uh, um, what? Yes, please, moderator, please, over to you. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so there, there's a question that says, what criteria or tools are used by the states to determine the high impact interventions? And how are the high impact interventions once identified are prioritized? That's a fantastic question. So what makes us different is that we are not, we do not dissipate energy trying to test any model. We already know what works. What we do is package what works, codify it and adapt it for scale. So many of the um, high impact interventions, we've had the privilege of having those interventions tested in our prede predecessor projects like the Nigerian Urban Reproductive Health Initiative, NORI, which I was very successful and recently closed out after a 10 year run. So it, those high impact interventions that we package together, make it really simple for anybody to take them and run with it. So it's those interventions that we take. But for every location, because we have to customize the engagement per location and every context is different, every need is different, even by geopolitics, we see dynamics in social norms, in practices, in, um, in even in patterns. You know, we, we ensure that every location or every state that comes on the partnership receive coaching from the very beginning. Once they scale through the expression of interest, we start coaching them to identify, to landscape the, the state, use the net mapping methodology to landscape. We take them through a very detailed work plan development process. We take them through a very detailed uh, program design process. And we have tons of tools which are housed um, in our TCI university that we use for some of these. And these tools are actually available for anyone that is interested in using them. And maybe I'll just take one more question and, um, and, and allow other um, presenters to respond. So um, I think there was, there was a request for the 12th state, which I've responded to. Um, there is a follow on question that says, what has been the key motivators or drivers for this state government to enlist to be part of the co-financing model? And my, my response here is that we, we marketed TCI to all, all the states, 36 states. You know, we use various platforms like the National Council of Health meetings. We use one-on-one -on -one, um, engagement. We wrote letters to the states uh, and all of that. So every state had the opportunity to apply. There was no bias whatsoever. And indeed, we received much more applications than the number of states we have right now. But what we did was that we ranked those applications by those criteria I, I did mention at the beginning of my presentation, which is system readiness, political will, local ownership, and all of those things. And so we ranked them and we faced how we engage with the state. And that is how we came about the phase one state, then the phase two state and, and phase three. But there are some states that really didn't make it. Um, part of the reason could be that their level of responsiveness was, uh, was not there or the interest, you know, they could um, jump on the idea from the beginning. But when we start telling them that this is the process it will take, you know, they, they, they go off. Or, when, they, or when, they, when we tell them that, you know what, you need to bring your skin on the game and bring some money to the table, some of them might become disinterested. So it's not like um, the co-financing thing has been fantastic from the beginning. It comes with a lot of hard work. It also comes with a lot of building trust building partnership, building rapport, and being transparent. Really, our success factor is the fact that we are open, we are transparent. Um, we, everybody knows everything that we spend, and we publish it. So it's not really a, a secret thing. Um, so we put the data out there. And of course, we also engage. We do not, um, we do not um, wait for the states to fail. We find ways of helping them to succeed. And even when they do not really meet the, the, the um, the benchmarks. We don't knock them off. You know, like there are states that may not necessarily get to the benchmark. In the new year, we work with them to see how can we work with you and ensure that we improve your spending and all of that. And um, just to say that it is also possible that states come on the partnership and they do not necessarily fulfill all the things that they said they will fulfill. There's also what we call early graduation, which means that we can decide that a state will not move forward in the partnership because they said they were going to do this and they didn't do this. So, so those are some of the um, dynamics that we actually bring into 
into the partnership. I think I'll stop there so that I have other people respond to. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Victor. Thank you so much, Dr. Victor. And um, any of our state's um, government representatives can answer this question. Um, what has been the most challenging aspect of the co-financing strategy? <clears throat> so any of the state's um, representatives can, can use the next one minute to answer the question, please. Uh, um, is Dr. Kara, Dr. Jaja, are you there? Oh. Okay. Yeah, this is Dr. Kara. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, now. Yes, I can hear you. Me. Please go ahead, Let just me. in 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 one minute. Well, one of our major challenges is this asynchronous budget system. You know, your own budget TCI runs within a different period of time, which is July to June. And for state government is January to December. So it's actually a very serious challenge to us. And then the dwindling financial resources of the state is also another challenge. Now, another major challenge is this issue of a uh, memo system by government in general, where whatever you want, it has to be a memo. Sometimes you write a memo, your governor is not in place for one month, two months, and that activity might not be executed. Until such a time when we begin to do strict budget discipline, whatever is budgeted, money is released at when due then to begin to move the way they are. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. So Victor, I think there are three questions in the question and answer box. You might um, answer it over there while I read the last few comments before, before we close. So really great presentation and responses from the team, great platform for FP Learning Exchange. Another comment, really um, great presentation and responses from the team, I think I've read that already. From Susan Rich, Victor, you continue to be the magician to implement, to implant ideas and then convince the locals that it is in their interest to shoulder and load the lead. Um, from Upman, the business unusual model of TCI has changed the orientation of state actors in financing health interventions in general. Thank you for this wonderful initiative. Um, someone said super learning environment. I think we have just three minutes to the clock. Um, I don't know yes. if Victor has seen the question. Okay. Yes, I have. I can jump on them real quick. Um, so the first question is- Okay, real quick. What are some of the key reasons for not selecting some states? Yes. So one of the reasons is like I didn't mention before, a state might not be very responsive um, and a state might just expect that um, because they've expressed interest, we'll just um, take money and give to them and they will just be running. So the rigor that will take the states through sometimes is discouraging for them. But um, if only they know that it's in their best interest to stay through the process. So that's one of the reasons. Another reason um, could be that they didn't meet all of our criteria because we have very detailed criteria. We actually have six criteria that we use to, to rank and, 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 and select states. Um, but what we do is that when we don't select a state for not meeting the criteria, we still support them to make some improvement in um, the gaps we identify. So coaching really starts from the moment you select, so you submit your expression of interest. And, and by the time we open the next round, those states are considered as priority um, to be considered. And the second question is how much longer um, do we have the project implemented? Yeah, so, so TCI is really evolving to a platform now, not necessarily a project. Our first phase comes to an end um, sometime later this year in September, but um, we are exploring the possibility of actually um, doing much more beyond that. Uh, we'll keep you updated. Um, what are the plans for sustainability? Well, like I said, sustainability is built from the very beginning. So once a state has budget line and they have the culture of being able to budget and release and they have all of those mechanisms to support, we are hoping that um, as we transition off, they can sustain that. But we also know that the issue of um, financial sustainability, it, um, it's something we'll continue to learn. Um, so the next is what domestic funding to the state use for co-financing. Yeah, I, I think um, I did mention that the states have multiple options. So they, they can fund from their budget line, their FP budget line. They can also fund from their primary health care budget because many of the states maintain FP budget line separately within the state ministry of health 
from the primary health care board. So they can fund from those two lines, like um, some of the states have alluded to. But the states can also fund from an intervention fund. For example, the 71 million life fund, you know, was availed to many states where family planning uh, is one of the pillars. In fact, pillar one. So what we did was made them realize that if you achieve your 71 million life performance on pillar one, you can get more resources from 71 million life funds. So they use 71 million life funds to, to match um, the partnership, what the requirements we did in partnership. And so it's a win-win for those states. So these are the different major channels. But just to also mention that we also explore, uh, we also capture data from other means that governments um, leverage these resources, like in kind, like when they provide a haul or when they provide a vehicle or when they um, do other things that are not necessarily financial, we capture that. And when they, when they approach a partner to say, hey, we have this money, we have this activity we need to implement, we don't have the resources, are you able to help us? So the fact that they're able to approach someone, we actually capture that as in, on the dashboard, but we do not count that as part of counterpart. Um, finally, I know I'm running against time. Um, how can my state key into the program, Emo State? Okay, well, the, our platform, we open different phases in our call for expression of interest. And whenever there's a call of expression of interest, usually writes to all the states. And we are hoping that by the time the next call for expression of interest opens up, um, your states will really take advantage of the opportunity. Um, but bearing in mind that all the requirements has to be met, including demonstrating that the state is willing to bring its skin in the game in terms of financial investment. I would like to stop there now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victor. It's been really engaging. Um, still some more comments. I know we're on the clock. I um, very much enjoyed the presentation and learnings focusing on sustainability from the get-go. Thank you. Um, really insightful presentations from TC and the state representatives. It's rewarding to see states being intentional about improving access and quality of family planning services through funding commitment. And thank you for this session. A lot of really great learnings about what works and where the challenges have been. Thank you for sharing. So as the comments keep rolling in, I really want to thank everyone, um, our state governments, the participants, the presenter, for the presentation, experience sharing, lessons, discussions, more importantly, our government team, the public sector, for bringing uniqueness and sharing insights from implementing the TCI model and by extension, engaging in the co-financing model. We are hoping that governments and partners will explore this unique and novel co-financing mechanism as a means to unearth um, emerging opportunities for leveraging family planning funding and also build family planning, fiscal accountability and responsiveness mechanism and also strengthen budgeting processes while catalyzing sustained investment, community action and ownership. Just in the words of our director, Dr. Victor, so more work is required by states to sustain the impacts that we have created, expand the frontiers and reach and intensify the momentum to ensure that no one is left behind. So I really want to thank uh, Kim and Lisa for supporting us from the other end. It's been great, it's been really interesting and the comments are still coming in. And uh, I think all the questions have been answered. So it's, um, thank you from me. So over to you, Lisa. Um, I don't know, are there, are there final words, Victor? And then we'll hand over to Lisa. So just to say thank you everyone for, for joining us on this conversation. Um, we are available, you can reach out to us. Um, our email addresses and our contact details are on the um, TCI website. And please visit um, tciurbanhealth.org um, where we have docked tons of resources, learnings, case studies um, for, your, for your use. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Udwa, Dr. Richter, and all the panelists. It was a really great session, and um, more to come. We'll follow up with um, a blog post specifically highlighting some of the key learnings that our state representatives so graciously shared with us all today. So as Dr. Vis Victor suggested, please do visit us often um, at tciurbanhealth.org. Um, um, Have a great day, all. Bye.
Thank you, everyone. I'm bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Well thank you, there. everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Tisia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.